Um, first, I should say good morning and thank you for coming. Um, as um, I mentioned, there's breakfast in the back of the room. Um, my name is Steve Lyons. Uh, I um, am going to be teaching, um, I guess it's two, six part sections. What do we call them? Modules? All right, so this, this is going to be a two-part module, six, uh, six lectures each. And what we're going to do is we're going to cover uh, the subject of intellectual property. Before I tell you why you're sitting here listening to someone to talk about intellectual property in a materials science structure course, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm uh, in real life. I'm a trial lawyer. Um, I have an office down, downtown called Cleaning and Lions. You can Google us if you want to find out all about me. Um, but what I do in life is I'm a trial lawyer. Um, does anybody know the difference between a litigator and a trial lawyer? Um, well, what is litigation? Okay, before I go any further, let me tell you the price for breakfast. I'll tell you first a little bit about my, my philosophy of education. To me, education is the accidental byproduct of discussion fueled by curiosity. It is not the memorization of facts. Um, I believe because you're all sitting in chairs at this school, you have already sufficiently demonstrated to the world that you can memorize facts and regurgitate them in some appropriate order. And so that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here, hopefully, um, to pass on some knowledge. Um, does anybody know the difference between knowledge and familiarity? Give it a shot. What's the difference, in your mind, what's the difference between knowledge and familiarity? Really, uh, say it, familiarity is uh, common things you see every day, and knowledge is stuff you read that you would normally have a mind of it. I wouldn't be sure either, but I think of knowledge is something that you know, learn from external sources. And different things, and things Has anybody ever been to the doctor? All right. Have you ever had a pain and you go to the doctor? And have you ever been to the doctor recently? What's the, what, what happens before you go see a doctor nowadays? This is a function of the insurance system. You get screened. You get screened, exactly. Who do you get screened by? A nurse. A nurse or a, or a physician assistant, right? And what does the, the physician assistant do? You, they come in and they say, what's your problem? And then they tell you what your problem could be. Basically, they give you everything you could probably learn by Googling pain in the neck, or pain in the back, or pain in the side. But really, what you're there to do is to understand what your problem is. And for that, you need someone with more than familiarity. Physician assistants have familiarity. But physicians have knowledge. What's the difference between the training a physician assistant has and a, and a, and a physician? It's, it's eight years of schooling. It's medical school. It's clinical uh, uh, residencies. Uh, and however many years of practice. It's, there's an enormous difference between a physician's assistant and a physician. A physician assistant may be familiar with medical terms but they don't have knowledge of that. A physician assistant can Google something, pain in the neck, pain in the arm, um, and be able to regurgitate those things that they memorize to you, but they have no understanding. What causes it? How do you get rid of it? For that, you need to go to someone with knowledge. That's the difference in my mind between knowledge and familiarity. You may, as an entrepreneur or as a student, be familiar with Twitter or Facebook. 
but do you understand how it can be used as a platform to improve communication or to network or to find out things that you want to know? That's the difference between knowledge and familiarity. And this, if you're running an organization, you know, being aware of things is very interesting. Te being aware of technology, being aware of things that you can sell is interesting. But understanding them is far more important. So what I want to do here today is have a conversation with you and in all the classes that we, that we have together. I want to have a conversation with you and provide you with knowledge of intellectual property that you can use later on. And the way we do that is, as I said, knowledge or education is the accidental byproduct of discussion fueled by curiosity. So I've prepared a very detailed and you know, a wonderful PowerPoint presentation with lots of facts and you know, you can look at it online as far as I'm concerned because there's plenty of facts there for you to memorize. And I'm sure that if you look at my PowerPoint presentations and you memorize them and you, can, and you regurgitate them in some order, you would be able at some point to pass any intellectual property question on a bar exam. But do you have knowledge of it? In my way, my, my, by my way of thinking, you don't have knowledge of it. What I want you to do is to be able to understand intellectual property in a way that you can make it meaningful and useful in your own lives, not only as students, but as entrepreneurs, and as scientists, and as authors, and as creative people. On the first day, I mentioned that Professor Eager and I, Eager and I have, I think, identified a gap in the education at MIT. You know, we teach you to be scientists, we teach you to be researchers, we teach you to write. We, at the Sloan School, you can't get into the Sloan School without being an entrepreneur. So we teach you all those things and we encourage you to do these things, but we don't teach you how to protect the product of your inspiration, of your creativity. And you'll find that as a student and out in the real world, it's very important for you to be able to protect the product of your creative genius. Going out into the real world with a degree from MIT without, without an understanding of how to protect uh, and apply in a useful way the product of your creativity and genius, it's like if you graduated uh, from law school but they didn't tell you the address of the courthouse. What good is it to have a legal degree if you don't know where to apply it or how to apply it? So, you know, you can, you can memorize what I have prepared. I've, I've spent a lot of time preparing these slides. And I can tell you, I know this stuff. And if you want to memorize it, you can go online and memorize it. But what I want to do in this classroom, and the reason why I bring, this gets me to the point, and this is where you find out the price, the reason I bring these uh, muffins and vegan chocolate uh, 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 muffins and gluten-free uh, products, um, the reason I bring these to class is I want to bribe you. Or let's use a better term, a more, more, uh, more gentle term. I want to incentivize you to come on Friday um, because um, the way we're going to learn, the way we're going to get knowledge in this class, we're not going to have familiarity. Familiarity is for people that, that, you know, memorize facts and books. What we're going to do is we're going to have a discussion. We're going to learn from each other. We're going to, we're going to have an actual, in order to be conversant with this subject, you're going to have to converse. So I thought if I brought in um, muffins, it would help you, it would encourage you to come into class. But my real, my real intent is to have you teach each other and teach me by discussing the subject matter that um, we've, all, we've all come here to, uh, to, to, to get an understanding of. Just along those lines, since you're the only one who's mic'd, if you can repeat their questions while you're going back. Absolutely, I'll do that. 
I can't wait for there to be some questions. Um, so, getting back to me, um, I'm, a, I'm a trial lawyer in real life. Um, the difference between a litigator and a trial lawyer is a litigator gets involved in the litigation of legal disputes. It involves filing papers, drafting motions, and all that kind of stuff. And while I do do that, what I actually do is I stand up on my hind legs and I walk into a courtroom and I communicate with jurors. And that's about 1% of the lawyers out there. A lot of people that call themselves litigators but don't really try cases. Only trial lawyers try, try cases. And a substantial amount of my practice actually involves intellectual property law. Usually, I come in at the end and clean up the mess that is created because people don't have an understanding. They may have familiarity with the subject matter, but because they don't have knowledge, they get into all kinds of trouble. And then they have to call in me, and I have to clean up the mess. But that's what I do. I go into court, I stand up on my hind legs, and I try cases involving intellectual property disputes, whether they happen to do, happen to do, have to do with patent infringement, copyright infringement, trademark infringement, all of those things are the kind of things that I do. And it's because of that that I have an interest in sort of filling this gap in the curriculum at MIT because uh, I see people like you in the real world who, are, who have their inventions stolen every day. Uh, people that write brilliant PhD theses, who go out in the real world, have wonderful ideas, uh, and then are literally have their, their creative genius stolen uh, by people who do that, who make money doing that. And if we can sort of protect you from that, sort of prophylactically, by giving you uh, the knowledge that you need to protect your creative genius, I'll feel better about the about things, and I know you'll feel better in the long run when you can profit from your own uh, your own creativity. That's what we, after all, that's what we're here to do. We're here to monetize our creativity. Uh, so, why are we concerned with intellectual property in material science? Can anybody think of? a reason why material science uh, intersects with, um, uh, with intellectual property. Any, anybody, eating a, any, anybody eating a muffin out there wants to, wants to pay for it now? I kind of, um, it, it's kind of a, a seed that can create ideas from. So people that have learned, gained the knowledge, now can use that knowledge to be creative and to something, something sure, exactly. It, 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 if you're a material scientist, um, you're involved with processes uh, and the development of new materials, or graphene, ceramics, all these new products that uh, involve material science. Well, the innovators of these wonderful materials all are protected by intellectual property rights. Uh, civil engineers can't possibly civil engineer without intersecting with intellectual property rights. Um, I mean, you, you, even as students, when you research papers, you're going to find that you have to respect others' intellectual property rights. And you'll want the papers that you write to be respect your intellectual property in them, to be respected, respected by other, other people. But as far as material scientists are concerned, almost everything that you do, from branding, you, know, you come up with a new process, you think of a clever name, that's a trademark. When you describe it in a PhD thesis, that's a copyright. Uh, and when you actually develop, you have a new brazing technique, or a hybrid ceramic that you, uh, that you bring to market, you, know, you, copy, you, you, uh, you patent that, or you patent the process. Or you th can you think of a new way of, 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 um, of laying down um, graphene, uh, other than the way they do it now, something that's cheaper and faster? 
you're going to patent that. You will fully monetize that and, um, and uh, become rich and famous, or at least rich. So material science intersects with the law of intellectual property in so many ways that to walk out of this, this university without an understanding of how to protect that intellectual property and how it interfaces with your chosen field of study, I think, is a um, lamentable gap in the curriculum here, and we're going to try to fill that. So um, that's basically what I want to do here. I want to have a discussion about intellectual property, and collectively together, we're going to develop knowledge of intellectual property that will be useful to you when you walk out of this classroom. In fact, as you, after you walk out of this classroom today, I expect you, you to know an awful lot more about intellectual property than when you came here, and that you'll be able to apply it even when you walk out the door. So um, can anybody here give me some examples of what they think of when I use the word intellectual property? Somebody that hasn't spoken yet. Come on, somebody that's somebody that's eating my ba my, my my muffins but hasn't contributed yet, or maybe somebody who has. Um, I would say things like patents and things that you come up with and new research and pretty much anything that you've developed that wasn't there before. Sure. Well, a patent is basically a certificate of ownership. Okay, it is the way we recognize your property right in something. Okay, uh, in some form of intellectual property. And so my question is, can you give me some examples of intellectual property? I think the happy birthday song. <laughs> That's a great example. I'm afraid to sing it because if I because if I sing it right now for you, and this is a good thing uh, for you that I, sister sister uh, sister John Gabriel, uh, one day came up to me in the fourth grade during choir practice when I was. I used to be on the platform. And I was singing away, you know, at the top of my lungs. And um, it was really the, the happiest I, uh, well, happiest anybody could be in parochial school growing up. And along came Sister G John Gabriel after one choir practice, and she called me over. And I thought she was going to congratulate me on, you know, the wonderful singing I had just done. And um, she said to me, you know, Stephen, um, you need listeners too. From that day to this, I have not, I have not sung again. So I'm not, I'm not. Thanks to, to Sister John Gabriel, I'm not going to sing Happy Birthday. But, but everybody who does sing a Happy Birthday owes a couple of bucks to two um, lovely ladies in, I think, Indiana, who own the, um, who, who own the rights to Happy Birthday. But yeah, Happy Birthday is an example of intellectual property protected by copyright law. Can anybody think of any other forms of intellectual property? I used to remember going, we had intellectual property against our composite layout technologies, but our way of skins and things like that. Absolutely. Well, first of all, what is Boeing? Uh, Boeing builds airplanes. I mean, well, the brand itself is that the best that is intellectual property, so the, the name right? could, could, could I call this a Boeing computer? Yeah. Why? Because Anybody that's flown on an airplane, would you rather? I mean, would you rather fly on an Airbus or would you rather fly on a Boeing product? Personally, I'd rather fly on a Boeing product, that's knowing that's what that's I know about Airbuses. Uh, I do aviation disaster litigation as well, uh, and based on what on, on what I know about uh, Airbus and Boeing, I'd rather fly on a Boeing product. Um, but 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 exam examples that you gave. Give, give give the class some of the examples of the of the types of products that Boeing has developed that have intellectual property protection. Yeah, I mean it can be any, so we have structural products. So let's talk about the actual wings, the the skins on the wings, the way that the skins are laid down. So the both the process that it's done, mm -hmm. and then the actual product itself. Um, we have intellectual pro protection against, and it can be even anything as small as we have you know a little electrical. Components too that are that are protected and it's uh, it can either be the actual individual component or it can be the uh, like the subassembly the combination of components the, the way that they're put together yep. is, right. is protected in certain yep. areas so um, 
there's a great example. I mean, you know, uh, I don't know how many patents uh, Boeing must own uh, or how many they must license, but it must be in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. Um, but that's a great example. Uh, anybody else can you think of? I'm almost really confused about the uh, Apple Macintosh versus Windows. And it seemed like there was a court case where Apple was saying, we have the idea for the mouse and the interface, and Windows stole it. But of course they lost that. I, I didn't understand why they would lose, because it seemed obvious. That well, you're jumping ahead about nine lectures, um, because I am going to get into some of the more um, uh, well-known lawsuits that involve uh, disputes over intellectual property rights. Uh, one of the things you'll find is sometimes in these disputes there are legitimate disputes, and um, at other times it's simply predatory capitalism. Uh, the fact that you have more money than someone else uh, give some companies the, the feeling that they uh, can infringe on other, on other uh, uh, companies' uh, intellectual property simply because they're bigger, stronger, faster, and can afford litigation. And in fact, companies like um, Apple and Adidas, and there's so many, uh, Microsoft, they've all engaged in predatory capitalism uh, in one form or another. In fact, if you're the, if you're the head of one of these corporations today, uh, intellectual property litigation is one of your management strategies. Who can we take advantage of? How can we acquire, at the least, uh, for the least cost, uh, the rights to uh, a process or a, a thing that is protected by intellectual property rights? How can we circumvent in intellectual property rights? Uh, it's, a, it's a going concern for every management person in a large or even small corporations. Um, Simone's uh, Corporation, uh, you know, with the uh, portable, non-destructive uh, investigatory device that he's, he's developed. I don't know whether it's based upon CT uh, technology or X-ray technology, but, but, you know, that's something that, you know, he's got to be concerned with that all the time. Uh, especially as, as he was talking about yesterday, as he tries to um, move into different marketplaces. You know, what sort of adaptations does he need to make to his device in order to penetrate other markets? That all involves uh, adaptations also to intellectual property rights. Maybe it requires the licensing. You know, look at, um, look at CRISPR litigation. I mean, you know, uh, everybody's read about that. But, you know, in order to do any gene editing nowadays, you have to license at least a dozen different types of, uh, of uh, CRISPR technologies that are owned some by the Broad Institute, some by MIT, some by University of California. You know, there's, there's many ways that these things intersect. Give me one more example. Uh, um, does anybody listen to music other than Happy Birthday? Um, but all, all music is, is copyright, copyrighted. Uh, computers, all software is copyrighted. Um, the, the, in, the, the list of items that are subject to intellectual property protection is practically infinite. Um, any uh, uh, photographs, snap a photograph, that's an intellectual property right. Um, let me ask you this. Um, why do you think um, we should recognize intellectual property rights. What, why, why, why does intellectual property need to be protected? This is the part where we, we're going to teach each other, we're going to learn from each other. So why should intellectual property rights be protected? What benefit is there for intellectual property rights being protected? Part of it, I think you talked about going into the monetizing part of it, right? So right. If, if it's not protected, it's much more difficult for the person who actually developed it to monetize it. Exactly. So if <coughs> her point is that if I'm going to invest a billion dollars to bring a drug to market, then I need to get that investment back. 
Uh, and if I don't have the right to protect that intellectual property, others will knock it off, will flood the market with their product without having had to make the investment in time and money and in creativity. So under the patent laws, we grant uh, companies uh, a license for 21 years to have exclusive use of their particular uh, innovation or invention, or their drug, or their skin on an airplane, or uh, whatever component it happens to be. So one reason is for to, to protect investment. But are there any other reasons? really kind of touching on it, but we need to think it through. Is it, is it more like, I mean, the other thing I think of with that is it incentivizes people to actually do the investment part of it, so it incentivizes people to uh, innovate. Basically. Exactly. When I came over here this morning, um, I um, uh, rode on, have it helped me, the red line. Um, but that's a technological advancement from a horse and a buggy whip. What drives innovation? What drives creativity? What drives our development uh, as, a, a, as a civilization? It's science and technology and creativity. We'd all still be, I argue, I would argue, riding around you know, with a buggy whip in our hand if it wasn't for the fact that somebody came along and invented the streetcar uh, and, inv and invented high-speed rail and invented all of the machinery necessary in order to create these advanced transportation systems. You know, that, that advancement in civilization is protected and fueled by intellectual property rights. Our, our ability to enjoy life and advance as a society depends upon intellectual property rights. When they go into the nuclear reactors uh, in order to determine whether or not the brazing welds uh, have been deteriorating, um, it's intellectual property rights that protect the device that shows us whether those brazing welds are, are deteriorated. Do we have to shut the plant down? Do we have to keep, can we keep it operating for another 40 years? Uh, how does society benefit from that? Well, you benefit from it every time your electric bill comes. Uh, every time uh, someone has to pass a new law uh, in, involving safety. Civil engineers all of the time are dealing with safety issues and regulations related to safety. Well, all of that intersects with, with intellectual property rights. Um, you can't develop uh, these proper safety protocols uh, unless you can understand what you're trying to protect people from. The reason why Boeing aircraft, um, you know, why, why they're built the way they are is because they need to be safe. Well, in order, to, in order to be safe, that requires invention, that requires intellectual property. So the protection of intellectual property rights not only advances us as a society, but it makes us safer. So we all, airplanes aren't dropping out of the sky, welds uh, in nuclear reactors aren't, um, aren't splitting, aren't spreading. Um, nuclear contamination around. Um, the drugs we take are safe to eat. Um, when, we, when, we, when we see a product in the store, uh, like an Apple computer, um, we can be sure that it's genuine. When we buy a Burberry raincoat on Newbury Street, um, we can be sure that it's not some knockoff uh, of poor quality. We can depend on the brand. All of that contributes to our our well-being as a society. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, uh, I think another reason why we should um, recognize intellectual property rights uh, and why they need to be promoted. Can you, can you think of any other reasons? Pleasure, profit, advancement, uh, confidence, anything else? Any help? I'm going to run through some of these slides just to show that uh, that uh, show you um, that I actually did a slide presentation. Um, and this, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a chapter in a book now on how blockchain technology is going to transform intellectual property. 
everybody here must know about blockchain technology, right? Algorithms, ledgers. Well, um, intellectual property truly has a historic scope. From uh, the statute of Anne, the statute of Anne was the was called the first copyright law. Back in 1710, they had a problem in Britain, and that was everybody was stealing whatever other people would write and profit by it. Someone would write a book, and another person would take the book, copy it, and sell it. And it was a big problem in England. And so they went to the queen. Can anybody guess the name of the queen? Check out the giant brain. Yes, Queen Anne. Uh, and, and, they, and they complained, and they said, we have a, we have a problem. Uh, people are stealing other people's creative, creative works. And they passed something called the Statute of Anne in 1710, which really was the first recognition of an intellectual property law. Actually, the Greeks and the Romans had sort of rudimentary intellectual property laws uh, uh, themselves. Um, but that was really the first modern um, intellectual property law. And it was replaced by the Paris Conventions, which are still in, a, in, a, in effect today. Um, but all the way up to blockchain technology. Now, you know, we have the United States Patent and Trademark Office, where we register all of our copyrights and all of our trademarks and all of our patents. Well, imagine if you could sit down at a computer, access blockchain technology, and register your creative work right then and there. And you think of how that might revolutionize how we deal with patents and trademarks and things like happy birthday. Um, now you can download music that has been pirated from almost, from almost anywhere. Has anybody here paid for music in the last five years? One out of, one out of 10. That sounds about right. Uh, that, sounds about, that sounds about right. Well, when blockchain technology takes over uh, the music industry, which it will, which it will, it's going to be 10 out of 10. Because blockchain technology uh, is a fast, efficient uh, method of um, registering, basically registering uh, copyrights uh, that is instantaneous, almost costs nothing, and is completely encrypted and uh, uh, not subject to fraud. It's the perfect system for selling music to people. But it, but it, it it's going to take over medical records, insurance, it's going to take over uh, just about every, it's going to take over banking next. Um, it's going to take over every single industry that involves multiple transactions. But when you think of the registration of property rights, that's a, that's a huge industry dependent upon recording multiple transactions, and blockchain check technology is going to be the future. So say goodbye to the United States Patent and Trademark Office, at least as we know it today. In a few years, it's going to be blockchain technology that's going to be protecting you all. And there'll never be a dispute, for instance, as there was in the CRISPR case, between who came up with the method first. Because if you can register it instantaneously, all those disputes go away. You, you don't have, you don't have uh, PhD students coming into court with their notebooks from a meeting in 19, or 2010 talking about uh, uh, genetic, uh, alt, uh, gen genetic programming, uh, genetic editing. Instead, it's registered right there. They, 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 now they register diamonds when they dig them out of the mine in South Africa. And because of blockchain technology, you can, you can follow that diamond uh, all the way until it ends up in a piece of jewelry. Um, and the, the same thing is going to happen to um, to intellectual property rights. It's going to be blockchain te technology that, uh, that takes over uh, our, our world. So we've, we've sort of gone through what intellectual property rights are and what is intellectual property. Let me ask you this. Um, what's the difference between this, the Statute of Anne? I, I even, even brought you a, a copy of the actual Statute of Anne. Um, and on the next slide, I, uh, I even give you the text of it. But it's, it's, you know, it's kind of fun to read, um, especially if you like this subject matter like I do. And, you know, it basically says, hey, Queen Anne, we've got a real problem out there. People are stealing people's public, published works. We need to do something about it. 
And um, that's what the statute of the end is. Um, I have a bunch of slides in here about how intellectual property law is recognized universally. Uh, there, it's part of the United States General Assembly Declaration of Human Rights. It is uh, considered a human right by all those countries that have adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That is, to enjoy the benefit of your, creative, your, your creativity. Um, countries that have adopted this all treat each other's uh, intellectual property rights the same. Um, it, it is becoming more and more universal. Uh, <clears throat> um, the United States actually just came into the 21st century by changing its patent laws to uh, match the rest of the world. We are in a country now where first to file is, what is who determines how patent rights are determined. It wasn't always that way. Um, and, and there is the, in place now a universal system for recognizing uh, patent, uh, copyright, and trademark rights. Um, and it's all on the slides. Um, as far as the United States uh, uh, patent law, or copyright law, and trademark law are, con are concerned, Title 17 of the United States Code uh, outlines copyright law. Title 15 of the United States Code, which is also known as the Lanham Act, uh, deals with um, trademark law. And Title 35 uh, of the United States Code, uh, which has some, I think, 400 sections now, deals with patent law. Plus, there's common law. So, if you have a if you have a, a device that uh, uh, or a process that you've patented or something a, a, a musical score that you have uh, copyrighted, um, not only do you have statutory rights granted by the federal government international rights granted by treaty, but you also have what are called common law rights. That are, that those are the unwritten laws, the laws that are developed by case, on a case-by-case -case basis by, by courts um, that provide you with, with an additional level of protection. So, for instance, if, if you have a copyright case and someone is in, you have a copyright and somebody's infringed on your copyright, you can sue them in federal court uh, under uh, Title 17 for violation of your federal copyright uh, copyrights, uh, but you can also sue them uh, for violating your state copyright, your common law copyrights. So it's it's there, there's very there's many levels of recognition. You have, you have common law rights, you have statutory rights, and you have rights con conferred by treaties internationally. Um, We've already gone through why we should uh, recognize intellectual copyrights, and we've gone through uh, the benefits of intellectual copyrights, and that's kind of the overview I wanted to give you today. But I didn't, I didn't want to let you leave before um, we, had, we played a little bit of a game. And to play the game, I have to teach you one thing. There's just one thing I have to teach you today about intellectual property rights. And that is what can and what cannot be protected. And if you walk out of this classroom knowing the difference between what can and one, what cannot be protected, then you will have benefited, um, um, I think, from uh, coming here today um, more, than, um, more than just having had breakfast. In order to be protected, and this is the golden rule of, of, of intellectual property, the Expression of your creativity must be in some tangible form. So, for instance, I think of a great idea, like maybe I'll start a social media platform, and um, I'm going to have half of the world join it, and it'll enable people to to interact with one another and post pictures of their dogs and their food and uh, otherwise uh, uh, interact. Um, is that something that's protectable? My brilliant idea to create this social media platform. You have the definition up there. Is that, using that definition, can, I, can, that, can that be protected? Of course not. Ask the, the, the Winklevoss twins. Ask them. They'll tell you the answer to that question. The answer to that question is no, because intellectual property rights 
have to be expressed in some tangible form. So an idea, no matter how brilliant it is, can't be protected. Is that new or is that within the last 30 years or it's always been? That goes back to the Greeks, essentially. Certainly, certainly the statute of Anne. So it goes back at least to 1710, but probably, probably further than that. I've heard people just sketch up an idea, a concept for a spacecraft, and do it this way, and then they just submit that sketch. And, 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 and what is protectable about that? If somebody, that look, if somebody builds something that looks like that, you can say, hey, they Scribbling it down is the expression in tangible form. So that is, that is protectable. So long as this idea that you have is expressed in some tangible form, it's protectable. As long as it stays in here, it can't be protected. Okay? I can imagine that a lot of abuse in that case. People just they spend all day doing these sketches and then throw it out there and just hope somebody does it. Then you can say, oh, I got you. Pray that you don't come back in your next life as a patent examiner at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Because that's what people do. Now that we are a first to file country, people will write almost anything down on a piece of paper and get it in there as a preliminary patent application. So that they can, they can get that protection of their fixed idea in tangible form. Now, the, the, the problem comes when the expression is not sufficiently detailed that, you know, so protection is only, you only get so much protection uh, as the fixed expression conveys. If it lacks sufficient detail, then you're not, that is not going to, you know, um, the warp drive that you're imagining, if it's not described, is, would not be part of the of the, of the uh, protection, but maybe the pretty design uh, that you've come up with will, will be. So it has to be in a fixed form in order for it to be protectable. If you think of happy birthday, it's not protectable until you write it down. Yes? Wouldn't patent costs be incentivized people to spew out a bunch of like half-baked ideas? They have to pay for a certain amount for every one of them? Um, Something real substantial? It. Well, the answer is yes. Um, there is a lot of frivolous um, uh, patent protecting going on, but that's what a patent examiner at the United States Patent Office does for a living. They basically uh, act as a filter, uh, and if it does not meet the criteria for the expression of a useful uh, device or invention, then it, then it won't get protection. But the reason why people uh, write stuff down as fast as they can and get it into the patent office is, is they want their that foot in the door. Um, now, oftentimes what they'll do is the design will evolve. Maybe later on you come up with a warp drive. Uh, and then you will add that to your patent. And later on you can combine patents. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a big race nowadays Quite frankly, uh, the best legal advice I can give you if you're an inventor out there, uh, if you have an idea um, and you think that it's valuable, um, file a preliminary patent application. And as time goes by, you can refine that and, and you can also refine your, uh, your application. So today, the, the, whole, the whole game is first to file. So oftentimes, things aren't fully developed when they make it to the when the first application uh, makes it to the patent office. But that doesn't stop you because you can always refine those things later on. We'll get into all that. We'll, we'll, we're going to patent something in the, in the class this year. We're going to actually take a product and we're going we're to create a patent application. Once you've done, you've done one, you've done them all. I'm curious about the happy birthday thing. Yes. <laughs> did they actually write it or did they just say, oh, nobody's claimed it, we're going to claim it? Well, I think that they are the descendants of the, of, of the composer. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, the, the two lovely ladies in Indiana that own the rights to this, um, uh, 
uh, acquired the rights either as part of an estate or they purchased it, one or the other, I don't remember which. Um, so it doesn't matter whether you're the original composer and own the copyright to it or whether you as a composer have now conveyed those rights via a license to someone else. Um, whoever holds the, the license or the rights is the one that can enforce it and is entitled to, entitled to payment when, um, uh, when it's used. By the way, we can sing happy birthday to each other here in this class. So long as we're not doing it for profit, so long as it is for educational purposes or it's strictly private, we can sing our heads off. Just be thankful for Sister John and Gabriel because you, won't, you don't have to hear it from me. But anything, any, so don't go home and think you can't sing happy birthday without having to send 70 bucks to somebody in Indiana. You can do it. But what you can't do is, is take that expression, uh, that copyright, copyrighted expression, and profit by it. You, you, can't, um, you can't sing happy birthday to a stadium full of people who are charging 10 bucks. Okay. All right, so with this idea in mind, let me finish the little game, that, or start the little game I had in mind. So um, what can't be protected? Um, there are certain things that, that are expressed that can't be protected, but are considered general knowledge, like uh, measurements, mathematical formulas, uh, scientific discoveries like gravity, can't, can't patent or copyright gravity, uh, certain business procedures, um, certain management procedures, uh, certain accounting procedures that are sort of generally accepted. You can't patent or copyright those things unless you innovate them, unless you change them in some meaningful way to make them better. So, but, but gen generally, you know, things like a chair can't be, um, uh, can't be patented because a chair was invented a long time ago. A wheel can't be patented. Um, a shovel can't be patented. These are things that are in the public domain. But if you have an innovation, uh, a fancy way of making a chair better, that would be patentable. Uh, if you have a, a fancy way of making a shovel better, some innovation, you could patent that. Um, you could patent uh, uh, anything that you can improve that's in the, in the, in the general domain. Uh, if you have a better mousetrap, you can, you can patent that. Um, so things that are in the general public domain, scientific discoveries, those things aren't protectable, but, uh, and, and, and even though they are in tangible form. So, I came up with some, a few things. Uh, this is the game I wanted to play with you guys. Uh, so, patented or not, <coughs> artistic performances. Anybody here go to the ballet? Oh, come on. Yes. Oh, good, good. You're a fan of the Boston Ballet? I haven't been to Boston yet. I'm from Seattle, but... It, 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 I mean, it, it's a treasure, honest to goodness, guys. You know, um, Lots of people pay hundreds of dollars to go watch uh, the Patriots or the Red Sox if they want to see real athletes perform uh, for one-tenth the price, um, go to the Boston Ballet. Um, if you've been to the Boston Ballet, they, one of the things they say is any reproduction or broadcast or recording or photographs during this pro performance are prohibited. Does that give you a hint? Protected. All right. Who says, this protect who says artistic per performances are protected? Yes, performances can be copyrighted, but only if they're original and, uh, and taped. Uh, so for instance, if you're performing a Shakespearean play, that's in the public domain, but your unique way of performing it is protected. How about articles of clothing? Look at this lovely sweater. It's about 40 years old that I'm wearing today. Is a sweater uh, protectable as intellectual property? Why? There's obviously some things about it that are different. Ah, okay, very good, very good. There are certain things about it, but how about the idea of a sweater? It's kind of like a shovel or a wheel, right? Uh, even though this is probably one of the oldest sweaters in the world. Um, you know, believe it or not, there have been sweaters around for a long time, but unique patterns or designs, absolutely protectable. So when you go and buy a 
Ralph Lauren sweater. You know how everybody walks around with a billboard on them? That little design, protectable. But, but the idea of a sweater, as brilliant as Ralph Lauren or Burberry is, uh, the answer is um, uh, it's not protectable. You know, while copyright protection is offered to visual art and architecture, fashion is not protected. But there are certain, some aspects of it, like designs. All right, words and phrases. Words and phrases have been around, around a long time. They would have had like, I love you, that's in for McDonald's is. Have it your way. Protect it without, I'm sorry, this is a burger game, right? <laughs> sorry. Um, copyrightable? Hands. Yes, yes it is. 100% yes, of course. As long as the year, words or phrases are unique or convey a something special uh, about a brand, protectable. But the words have it your way are not protectable because they're, obviously they're in the public domain. But when you put them together and it has a particular meaning, the answer is yes. Even the font. Right? The, well, even the font, absolutely. Uh, our Boeing person has left. But you know, remember the Boeing logo? I mean, it, it, you know, it, it looks like it's going fast. That's protectable. The, the, the swoosh on Nike, I'll tell you all about that, cost uh, uh, Phil Knight 50 bucks. Some poor student at the University of Oregon designed that thing. You know how much that logo, that intellectual property is worth today? It's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. 50 bucks Phil Knight got it because he didn't go to this course. That student didn't go to this course. How about business ideas? The idea itself, no, but I need to, it's written out or so that there's some fixed table. Bingo, yes. exactly. And, and this is, this is you know, where we, um, we already talked about this, the Winklevoss twins, you know? Um, uh, some famous successes and fizzles. YouTube acquired by Google for 1.65 billion. Today, today it's worth between 27 and 40 billion, while Google is worth 527 billion. How about uh, Friendster? How many belong to how many people belong to Friendster? That was a famous fizzle. Um, so even when it's expressed in a fixed or tangible form, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be successful. It's protectable, but it may not be worth protecting. All right. Um, how about conf confidential information and trade secrets? How about the, has anybody heard of the, the recipe for Coca-Cola? Protectable? All right, so what do you do to protect it? Trademark? Well, the Coke, the Coke logo is trademarkable. What do you do, go write the, write the formula down and, um, and um, go to the copyright office and say, Here's the formula for Coke. Would that be a good business decision? The answer is no. But it's protectable as a trade secret. So long as you treat it as a secret, um, the formula for something like that is protectable. Not as a copyright, not as a patent, not as a trademark, but as a business secret. And in order to be a business secret, it has to be a secret. So they literally keep the formula for Coca-Cola in a safe at Coca-Cola headquarters in Atlanta, and it's known to two people. It's outdated or formalized? Doesn't have to be because it's a secret. It's a secret. Seems like you could almost pull out, make it and say, "Hey, I did that." Well, um, it, it, you, you have to. Well, you'd have to hire a guy like me. We'd go into court and we'd have a contest and we'd see who invented it first. And we'll see whether or not you stole my secret or not. All right. Um, almost done. Um, next week, or Monday, no, Tuesday, uh, we're going to talk about who has an Apple computer. All right. Did you carry it home in a bag? We're going to talk about the Apple computer bag and how many examples of intellectual property exist in a simple Apple computer. You think the Apple computer bag is simple? Well, 
I'm bringing an Apple computer bag on Monday and we'll, uh, Tuesday, and we'll talk about how um, how intellectual how much intellectual property goes into a simple bag. That's it. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having breakfast. Take something with you. And most of all, thanks for participating. I really appreciate this. Um, before you go, I have a handout. You know MIT? Data, data, data. Well, I'm the same way. Um, if you don't mind, you can either fill it out now or fill it out and bring it back to the next class you happen to go to because um, I really want to design this class in a way that 